Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with James Cahill. So we're up at Soder Vineyards. Uh, it's January 10th, 2019. And James, we'll start you off with a nice, easy question, which is why wine? Oh my goodness. Um, it's not an easy question, I don't think. Um, <laughs> in a world full of interesting things to do, um, and certainly in this industry, uh, just judging from the people, really diverse backgrounds, right? So I don't think I'm alone in saying that I've kind of found my way into wine in general, and uh, uh, and even even finding my way into production, I mm -hmm. suppose, a story. But um, one thing led to another. Like a lot of folks in the business, uh, was waiting tables, and somewhere along the line, uh, in a restaurant nice enough to have a significant wine list. And I think from the first time that I heard someone who was positioned as an expert mm -hmm. uh, defining what was interesting about wines on the list, uh, there was something about it that was attractive. And I think uh, when I say attractive, there was a, a mix of, uh, of course, hedonism. Stuff tasted better than I thought it would. And then, of course, the cultural elements mm -hmm. that we discover the minute we start to take up the study of wine, that there's uh, something that goes well beyond just an alcohol beverage to like a story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the idea of tasting a a French or Italian wine uh, in Austin, Texas, where I was uh, not exactly growing up, but coming of age, uh, it was just really powerful to me that we were tasting the, if it's a bottle of Beaujolais, it's Beaujolais just like it is in France. Mm -hmm. not, not an American version of it, mm -hmm. but a real bit of something from a faraway place. Um, and that was always intriguing. And of course, the minute you open a book, there's history right that comes really alive and uh, yeah just in immediately engaged and door after door opening and uh, continued to be really uh, interesting to me on, on many levels so you're in Austin Texas and you discovered this this passion for wine this interest in wine yep. what happens next uh, yeah, uh, jobs and things like that, right? I mentioned, you know, waiting tables, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, any good waiter knows that uh, you can always increase the check a little bit, and I suppose um, a better restaurant or two. Um, uh, worked under a fellow, it's actually a dear friend that's still in the business, uh, was running a very fine dining room, tuxedo wearing, cooking table side, and he would pulled me into that program, and uh, there was access to some very nice wines, mm -hmm. and uh, it became apparent that uh, it's not like I'm a gifted taster or anything like that, but I think because I was paying attention, I uh, could tell the difference between Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Noir without struggling with it, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. again, just leading me further into that path. So, uh, yeah, um, uh, access to wines, opportunities to talk about wine, and uh, ultimately entering the retail game was uh, what would be a, a real job, right? Mm -hmm. That was, uh, for a liberal arts guy, um, a strong pull, right? To have, uh, have a paying job. And uh, I just happened and continue to be very lucky in terms of the people that I've bumped into. I mentioned doors opening mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, from the first time I had a position as a retail buyer, uh, lucky to uh, even travel with some American importers, some really famous guys, as a matter of fact, uh, which ultimately led me to Oregon. Sure. So before we get to Oregon, let's talk a bit about the, the Austin Wine Merchant uh, mm -hmm. and kind of an educational experience there and, and what kind of, you talk about doors opening, what kind of doors that opened for you? It's interesting because um, my choice to go to work there was uh, arguably I was in a position with total autonomy, a big budget. Um, some success in a neighborhood grocery, actually a couple locations, and uh, and a, a path to do some different things. But uh, the decision and opportunity to work for John Rennick at the Austin Wine Merchant, he's still there and still running a great uh, business, represented a chance to learn about Burgundy, which um, continues to be uh, uh, some of my favorite wines on earth, right? And, and uh, you would think in the middle of Austin, Texas in the late 80s, finding 
fine wine would be a bit of a stretch, mm -hmm. right? Austin wasn't as polished and fabulous as it is right now, right? <laughs> it was a cheap place to live, which people couldn't believe. I think the cost of living was modest. You could have a, a good, really good way of life. But John had worked with a, a portfolio as a representative for Seagram Chateau and Estates, which is uh, not probably uh, known to folks of your generation, but um, importing uh, uh, Rumier, Nielon, Ramonet, uh, some of the greatest Burgundies on earth were right there in downtown Austin, Texas. And uh, a modest position opened up at the Austin Wine Merchant and I was quick to throw my hat in the ring and, and again through John met some really interesting people and ultimately got here to Oregon. So what was your role there then at the merchant? Just, uh, you know, a guy a little more than stocking shelves, you know, because I came to the position with, uh, again, having been a buyer with autonomy. Mm -hmm. I had a, a really good working knowledge of wine, probably better than most. Um, I'd had an opportunity to, uh, you know, be engaged in the trade where uh, I'm I giggle thinking that uh, Albert de Villene from the Domaine de la Romaniconti came into the little store I was working in, right? Wow. Which I, I look back at that now, like how unlikely <laughs> was that, right? That, uh, uh, but in other words, I'd, 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 I'd had a pretty significant uh, uh, understanding and experience with wine. And uh, at the wine merchant, it was definitely going to be a John with a role of mentor, but really focused, very focused on kind of another level. Mm -hmm. And that is exploring the little individual climats of Burgundy, which, uh, you know, I still have the great big maps of the Cote de Nuit and uh, Cote de Bone on my walls. And uh, learning about all those little places was really what it was about. And learning to interact with a very generous clientele, that is worth talking about, that um, part of working in a shop like that um, gave me access to a circle of people who'd been collecting wine for 20 years and any true wine lover likes to share mm -hmm. right so these gentlemen were kind enough to show me old vintages of uh, wines that I'd be embarrassed to uh, mention the provenance and just how uh, uh, yeah, let's suffice it to say they were very generous and it opened my eyes to still another level of uh, what really fine wine could be about things that are sadly almost uh, unattainable for uh, folks like Lily that are entering the business. The wines are so rare and so expensive now, hard to come by and it was a real privilege sure. uh, through that. So more than the position which was something like a clerk or maybe a shelf filler or something, you know, uh, there was the fact that I would be talking to people with a very high level of knowledge really regularly. So what was it about Burgundy wines in particular that drew you in? Oh, uh, you know, I think something about the style of the wine immediately compelling. Um, two things come to mind that, you know, kind of the old story about of the very best wines you've ever tasted in your life. Perhaps you know this little uh, quote I uh, could be Clive Coates or one of mm -hmm. the great masters, you know, of the hundred best wines he ever tasted. Uh, uh, five of them were red burgundies. Of uh, the hundred worst wines he'd ever tasted, five of them were <laughs> red burgundies, right? That, um, there's tremendous diversity there, but there's something seductive about uh, we could take it to the broader Pinot Noir as a, uh, as a, a grape and the wines that are made from it. Um, something uh, that I think often represents almost an evolution in people's palates to be able to recognize uh, a depth of flavor without big, tannic, impressive structure. And then of course the nuance from producer to producer and place to place was just, and of course the changes with vintage, right? Mm -hmm. um, really compelling to me to, uh, to explore the, the diversity in those. Sure. So you mentioned that the, the, through this, through your work in Austin, you ended up in Oregon. So tell us how that happened. Yeah, um, it's a, a kind of, um, I can point to a couple people who were responsible for that, that um, I'd been lucky enough to run around France with uh, first a representative of Kermit Lynch, um, a guy named Bruce Nyers, uh, who was a great wine guy. And uh, obviously Kermit Lynch, uh, quite quite well-known American importer and uh, had the privilege of visiting some in incredible uh, 
properties from uh, uh, Domaine Tompier in the south of the uh, lunch I can still remember, and uh, Zind Humbrek, uh, uh, amazing wines. Uh, and to the point, um, a guy named Robert Ketcher, who was an American importer, um, who had a relationship with the Austin wine merchant. And um, he carried one American Pinot Noir, and that was Beaufrere. Mm. And uh, I had uh, grunted around a few wineries in the area, put a few vines in the ground even, and dragged hoses. Actually, was quite a nuisance uh, to one winemaker in Texas. I won't mention his name, but he was kind of the guy. And uh, we traded, at the time, faxes and um, I had just about convinced him to hire me for a harvest position and he realized I didn't really, I lived in Austin, I had other interests and he was like, this is too much of a distraction. But I asked Bobby about um, doing volunteer harvest work mm -hmm. in Oregon at Beaufrere because he was obviously well connected. Beaufrere was a very new property at this time. This is 95, 96 we're talking about. Still a very uh, young project, but uh, certainly um, conspicuous mm -hmm. on the uh, American wine landscape, hence a French wine importer carrying one American wine, right. it was Beaufrere. And uh, Bobby uh, literally gave me a kiss on the forehead and said, we'll see what we can do to put you in touch. And Mike Etzel was brave enough to, uh, uh, to let me come up and begin a harvest. So what were your initial impressions of the Oregon wine industry once you got here? You know, it's a tricky one because um, I had an impression of the industry that went back probably a decade before I came here, at least the better part of seven, eight years. I can remember when opening a bottle of Panther Creek, some of Ken Wright's first mm -hmm. efforts, and um, it was noticeable that was something very different going on than the, I will name names, uh, Saintsbury was a, a kind of a benchmark uh, American Pinot. Um, for, again, folks like Lily, young folks like yourself, in any fine wine shop, you would have seen St. Sperry as a representation of American wine and mm -hmm. a few others. But looking back on them, you know, kind of strawberry and delicate, uh, this Oregon statement was something very, very different, right? Ken's first vintages, there was power and density in the wines that I hadn't really seen in the confectioned California versions that were uh, popular, I would say, in the late 80s, early 90s, and then efforts from uh, Ponzi. And I remember the Domain Drew in 92 Lorraine as a, wow, there is something really going on here. So the industry was already uh, there. Now getting here, um, hitting the ground, I was surprised at how uh, we used to use the word provincial things were, <laughs> right? That um, that it was uh, a very young, very simple industry. I had visited wineries in California and Napa and felt like that was another world, right? Kind of glossy and already uh, established in so many ways. And um, as much as uh, wines like, you know, that I saw here, uh, Brick House and Beaufrere were, you could say, had a good reputation it was they were so simple the mm -hmm. same people uh, growing the grapes as making the wines and uh yeah i was struck by the provincial nature of it in a good way and um also struck by how welcoming uh people mm -hmm. were to those of us who might want to make a contribution you hear him just a second here on the sorry thing. for the background that's, that's okay we're used to doing these in <laughs> tasting rooms <laughs> Would it be possible for you to do that in the kitchen? Uh, I gotta get it roll. I'm not sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. We got. We got a minute. Thank you. Come down for a little bit. All right. So you mentioned kind of simple and welcoming uh, i'm curious uh, did your impressions change as you became part of the industry or did it did it, did it stay similar for a while uh for a long while i continued to be nothing short of uh amazed by uh the level of uh, openness and accessibility which people talk about a lot but um i can still remember uh 
just how really generous people were if you asked a question. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Dorner at Christum, I would call with uh, questions. You know, he uh, um, certainly uh, an innovative and uh, making really distinctive wines. Uh, always had the time of day for me. Mm -hmm. um, Ken Wright showed me around his cellar, talked openly about techniques that he uh, used for fermentation all the way through process, just not holding back a bit about mm -hmm. uh, and having time for that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, I learned so much from the neighbors. Um, literally, uh, don't think I'd have a job today if it weren't for uh, Bryce Spaniel, who sadly passed a few years ago. And one of the beautiful things about your archives is like we would hope to remember guys like that. That mm -hmm. um, you know um, was Bryce was had a, an enology degree and a thing that at the time a lot of people didn't mm -hmm. hear right and. Uh, he was very patient and, as I say, generous, literally showing me um, hands-on how to do lab work that uh, helped me be able to earn a living here, sure. right? Sure. Did anybody ever talk about why they were so welcoming? We, we hear this all the time from people. Was it, was, it a, was it a conscious effort or was it just the people who happened Boy, to be didn't, here? It didn't seem um, uh, either conscious or... Uh, anything people thought about. It was just a very different way of life. And I think, uh, and a, again, an emphasis on a, not just a, an industry, but a way of life, right? That um, seemed to translate from really genuine uh, human goodness, mm -hmm. right? That um, there was nobody needed to make rules about it or, or say that this is our culture. Um, you know, obviously the mythology that I think happens to be true is that uh, having worked for some of the first families around here that there was a certain reliance on your neighbors, right, to share equipment, to share ideas. Mm -hmm. the, the sharing is fundamental for certainly the original guys, right, the OG. I think that isn't just a myth, I think that was real and I think what they uh, fostered um, in kind of my generation, this kind of not the OG, but certainly a new wave of uh, really interesting people, I think. Uh, it, it was just a natural cultural phenomenon that we all live here. Um, we're all very bullish about what's happening. We all want to do better. Mm -hmm. We're all, no one trying to make the best Oregon wine, but trying to make some of the best wines in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there was nothing conscious or uh, there was no memo, right? It was sure. just very natural that people worked together, tasted together, and uh, I still think that remains, but there was probably a little, um, the industry would seem to have been a little more intimate in those days, just less of us, I suppose, yeah. right? And by virtue of that, uh, you saw a little bit more of your neighbors, whether it was the IPNC or meeting somebody at the vineyard supply store or, uh, uh, you know, where there's wine supplies now, they were sold out of the back door of Davison Auto Parts, right? Mm -hmm. When it was much more an auto parts store <laughs> than a wine supply <laughs> place. So uh, yeah, just um, seemed very natural that it was just part of the culture, mm -hmm. that uh, there was a genuine sense of community. Sure. What were some of the initial challenges you faced going from selling wine, buying wine in a store setting to working in the industry? Yeah, that I was um, very much, uh, I don't want to on some level a lot of things, paying attention to tasting and paying attention I think was what translated if I brought anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenge was of course just kind of a lack of uh, uh, science or education or having, you know, I came into it green and with one mentor that was Mike and it's really interesting, you know, right from the start, Mike Etzel, that is, of mm -hmm. course, and uh, it, as I look at it, it, Mike had worked a few harvests with Dick Ponzi and at the time I think he borrowed very heavily um, from what he had learned from Dick Ponzi, right? Mm -hmm. like, 
techniques and culture, so probably didn't have a very broad understanding of what was going on, but that's what changed very quickly, at least in terms of what was going on in the industry through the generosity of folks that I alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. right? That people were so willing to share that the things I lacked, which was a technical experience, book learning, for lack of a better <laughs> word, and, uh, and of course even hands-on experience, um, very fortunate to be fast-tracked by um, learning from what other people have done. I mm -hmm. think that's a fair answer, right? Sure, absolutely. So you land at Beaufrere on a basically volunteer basis. Yep. What happens next? Um, I sheepishly, um, Mike would remember this moment as well. Um, I kind of got wind that uh, he had had help from a number of folks. Bryce Spaniel had worked a harvest or two with him, um, had had interns in, but he was ready. Uh, There's one guy there before me that was kind of a, a, I don't know if he was exactly full time, but he had a right hand, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, after having worked super hard to establish the vineyard for selling grapes and then developing a winery um, on a very modest budget at the time, mm -hmm. um, Mike was ready to hire an assistant that could help him clean hoses and do things, free him up to do other things. And I think his thinking was that he didn't want to make his life more complicated, right? He'll get somebody, you just do what I do, right? And uh, much like you would train that sheepdog we were talking <laughs> about, right? They just do what, the, what their dad taught them. And so uh, uh, Mike needed some help and I sheepishly said, uh, you know, gee, is there any way you would consider me for a position like that? And uh, I think he was struck by a level of uh, sincerity, uh, the fact that I took a risk just asking, right? Because there's, uh, you could say, what's the worst that could happen? You, you get no, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it would be a kind of a humbling moment too. And having spent uh, weeks with him working really long hours and, uh, uh, and he knew, you know, he could see by my habits a little bit about me. He knew a little bit about what he was getting into. And of course he knew that I was hungry enough to go to work for a very modest work, let's <laughs> say, <laughs> right? But um, that was, uh, yeah, that was just uh, asking Mike if it would be possible. He weighed it, and he's a really creative guy and also a very spiritual fellow, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, I think uh, he probably went with his gut and said this might work, and I'd like to think I made a nice contribution there for the time I was sure. with him. Sure. And then what, what caused you to move on to the next thing? Boy, it's a really great question. Um, uh, you know, after four or five years, uh, I was comfortable in the position. Again, feeling like I was making a contribution it was a beautiful exposure to vineyard work, which was requisite. And certainly one of the things I learned from Mike is that the quality of fruit we're growing translates so directly into wine quality, right? Just the most fundamental thing, that that's where, and it continues to be a mantra for us here at Soder, that um, we're looking at how we can grow better wines, right? And sure. that was really fundamental. And um, I'd mentioned that I'd spent a lot of time knocking on doors and uh, snooping around. Uh, Jimmy Brooks, another sadly gone way too soon, was working at Willa Kenzie and. I'd go and top with Jimmy and, you know, top barrels and do cellar work because it was a chance to get out. Um, part of exploring, including, you know, a, a curiosity about potentially buying a little site. Um, Adam Campbell mm -hmm. uh, from Elk Cove uh, became a friend, uh, a trusted associate, and uh, we spent a lot of time running around looking at vineyard sites, talking about wine, visiting places together. I can still remember visiting Archery Summit with him, uh, just as an example. Um, and Adam uh, had uh, a, a longtime assistant was leaving, and he had a position to fill that was something more than a winemaking job, and certainly. They, his family had grown grapes from, for his whole life, right? So uh, uh, it was really not so much time to leave Beaufrere, but uh, I talked to Mike about it, and it wasn't like I'd done all I could do there, but uh, certainly Mike was the owner, winemaker, had young sons that were coming along. Sure. 
for me, again, curiosity and uh, interest um, kind of led me uh, uh, to uh, ask to work with Adam and uh, sure enough signed on with winemaking responsibilities and, and vineyard work and still can't believe um, some of the things we did together, right? Like who would give me the keys to a new vineyard site to plant? But um, he uh, mentions that uh, a good bit of the work we did was quite successful. And of course, Elk Cove, Adam was, I'll never forget these words. Um, again, another uh, fellow, um, Aaron down at 12th and Maple said, Adam was burnishing what was a brilliant reputation from Elk Cove. You know, the, his parents had grown the thing and Adam really, I think, took them to another level. And it was really exciting to be there with him. And uh, he continues, I think, to be an innovator and a leader very quietly. One of the things you can so respect about the whole Campbell family, right? Um, but it was a real privilege to get a chance to work with him. And um, yeah, I, um, I'd have to say it was not like the urge to do something else so much as an opportunity mm -hmm. that proved to be irresistible. Mm -hmm. So talk a little, you talked a little bit about what you did when you were at Elk Cove, but talk a little bit more about uh, sort of the de developments you did there along with Adam. Yeah, well, um, you know, it was uh, sadly at Beaufrere, uh, phylloxera had been discovered, right? And um, there was a clear response. One of the things I look back fondly is building compost piles with Mike in the late 90s. and. Uh, there was a, a great lady, Elaine Ingham, the Soil Food Web, uh, was talking about the possibility of perhaps changing the microbial populations in the soil enough to combat phylloxera, oh, which was a motivator to get involved in this compost building, which he continues to love to do, and it was my first experiences there, and, and vineyard development going on, mm -hmm. which uh, I was lucky to be, uh, be there to plant the upper terraces with mm -hmm. Mike, which was the, a new site and kind of a clean slate and rootstock, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which was at Beaufrere, but a new chapter opening up. And uh, um, had been with Mike long enough that again, just kind of tried to do my best to do what he did, right? Sure. And that translated pretty well into a big project at Elk Cove, which mm -hmm. was the beginning to planting Mount Richmond, their first plantings on rootstock. And like many things, uh, boy, looking back, uh, I would have done it a, maybe a little differently, but um, the fact is we sure got it done. What was a high density planting um, on a beautiful slope with great plant material and uh, uh, one way or another managed to get it done. Mm -hmm. that, um, that felt really good. Sure. And, uh, and if Adam's uh, telling the truth about the fact that it went pretty well, then good for everybody, <laughs> right? And then how did you end up here? Um, yeah, a really happy story. Um, you know, Tony was, uh, his timeline was, um, he'd been in Oregon, um, 1997, uh, which you, I realize a lot of you weren't even born in 1997, <laughs> right? Which is kind of a giggle. Terrifying. But um, it was a pretty difficult harvest, you know, from 95, 6, 7, all had their challenges. And uh, so Tony came in, baptism by fire, a rainy, difficult harvest at Beacon Hill, uh, made really nice wine. The first sparkling wine I ever did was there. So Tony's up and running with a small family wine farm. You know, he and his, his dad making, you know, the wine in a garage of a little house. You know, this is like an iconic, really famous American winemaker, literally making the wine with his dad, charming, right? And um, I think when we originally talked, uh, we did, an interview at this site, right, where it was bare ground at the time, that is, we're at the Mineral Springs Ranch, of course, and uh, what we saw was opportunity. Tony had uh, just sold Etude and uh, had a pretty good size stack of chips in his hand. He describes being uh, a little bit wealthy for a very short period of time because <laughs> he literally bet the fortune on, uh, on this farm, right, the family fortune on this farm. And so we knew this was coming, but it was just planted uh, in the first years, of course. So the first ones that I got to work on with Tony was uh, Beacon Hill. And I very much had a little flip cell phone kind of anchored to my shoulder while he was in Napa and uh, got to know each other that way. Uh, uh, basically, I guess he was looking to hire locally 
um, hoping to keep a foot and feeling needing to keep a foot in California mm -hmm. and still wanting to grow the Oregon project. And I think he was looking for someone who could uh, uh, do the hands-on winemaking for him and perhaps with a little bit broader skill set and uh, uh, yeah I, I got a call at home and it was uh, you know my wife had picked up the phone again you guys couldn't imagine you know old rotary dial phones <laughs> or even button phones but the the phone attached to the wall rather than but she'd answered the home phone and said it's Tony Soder and I was like you know who? <laughs> and it was Tony, and he was very polite, and someone had, uh, I guess, spoken well for me and said he'd like to talk about a position. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, did a few interviews. He had talked to a number of really bright people, and, uh, and I just said, you know, you said to me, do you, uh, anything else you want to say? Any, anything you want to know from me? And I said, well, um, I think I'm good. And I called him back a day or so later and said, I did fail to say something, and it's that I really want this job. <laughs> and I think he he, uh, he got a kick out of that, and he also knew I meant it, right? The idea to work with uh, someone, and in fact, in talking to Adam about the imminent departure, um, I think you know he could see why, although I was only a little more than a year at El Cove, that it was a pretty interesting opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's how it started. So what, what is your role here and kind of how has it evolved? That's a, it's certainly evolved <laughs> and uh, you know, what I do may be mysterious. Um, I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of uh, young guys here that are working very hard in production and uh, winemakers. And why, while I may have that title and just walked out of a blending session, right, um, still engaged. Uh, these days, I handle all the great contracting. One of my favorite things continues to be, uh, it's just a privilege to work with uh, the growers in this region. Um, you know, right from the start uh, with Tony, had a relationship with Joel Myers, who I consider a family friend, and uh, I just can't begin to talk about the interesting and talented people that we've worked with in the grape growing range, which would include Ken Kupperman from Jackson Family Wines now, uh, Ken Johnson uh, working for uh, the wine growers operation uh, from based out of Washington, uh, uh, Buddy Beck, longtime industry and angel. Uh, long time industry guys, so many, I, I hate to name names because inevitably someone gets left out, mm -hmm. but really, really interesting people and um, uh, I think often don't get enough credit for the great work that happens in this region. Wild animals <laughs> here on the prowl, obviously comfortable. So um, yeah, my role is, uh, I have certain tasks that uh, uh, grower relations might be one thing and get to work with a variety of sites, some of them more than 10 years. And I, uh, I along with my friends who are entering the building, uh, are working harder than ever to sell wine. And not because uh, uh, it's just a, a, it's a new chapter for Oregon where in a lot of ways I always think of the first generation of all the hard work they did when Oregon was kind of region other. Well, now we're an established region, but um, it's also been become rather competitive sure. with uh, lots and lots of wineries, right? So I spend a lot of time as a brand ambassador, and I'm really uh, proud of that work. As uh, um, not that someone couldn't do it better, but certainly uh, I truly believe in what's happening in this region, what we're both what we're doing here and what we're doing regionally as important and uh, and delicious, right? Sure, sure. So let's talk about that, about the, the challenges of sales. Uh, we, we obviously hear this a lot. It's, it's almost everyone's least favorite part of the industry is actually trying to sell the wine. Yeah. So talk a bit about how that, like you say, how it's changed and, and what the challenges are now. Yeah, so, um, you know, certainly some of my comrades along the way have really, um, and here's where I probably wouldn't name names, but have been, uh, there's almost a sense of arrogance about, I do this and it's my craft and I'm not gonna bother with that. Uh, I think I could include Tony in that uh, we love doing this thing and one of the ways we ensure doing this thing again next year <laughs> is to sell what we made this year, right? Sure. Like, and um, I, I don't, it's not like, 
you know, a, a work kind of obligation, but I do think, um, you know, to be able to keep the wines relevant is a word we're hearing a lot in a very, you know, for all the time I've been here in the first years for soda, I didn't leave the county, right? And then about the time the big recession happened, uh, it was clear that the industry was changing, right? In terms of buying habits and how things found their way into distribution. And this is particularly about uh, uh, national sales, right? Mm -hmm. Not direct to consumer, which is a whole other story. But um, yeah, I think um, if I'm getting to the question you asked, uh, <laughs> I do think um, where it's work, like everything else, uh, and not an obligation like you've got to do this to get this. It, I do feel like we're privileged to do this work, whether it's an art or craft or however people see it. And uh, um, again, I think Tony was uh, uh, always uh, a dynamic personality, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, could tell the story in a way that, uh, with both conviction and intellect, that um, you don't see every day, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think the building Etude, for example, his personal project um, was very much built on uh, his convictions and personality, right? And um, so with that as a model, uh, I've never um, seen it as anything but a kind of, we're lucky to be doing the work we're doing. Sure, sure. Talk a little bit about your, your your kind of growing practices here. I, I know you're biodynamic. You talk about sustainability. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, about uh, kind of your the different kind of practices you have, the, your philosophy behind why you do what you do. Yeah. So there'd be things. You know, my personal journey has been um, really delightful in that um, the people I worked for um, early on, Mike Etzel, where um, his heart and soul was in that vineyard, like literally. Every vine was like a child to him. It was, again, a small property at the time, so that may sound, uh, you know, again, like a cliche or whatever, but his heart was really in that vineyard. And um, one of the great things watching an artist like Mike is um, when people are able to leave things alone, right? Questioning why do we acidulate? Why do we. Why would we add these things if we don't need to, right? Mm -hmm. That um, practices in the vineyard were there were certain chemicals that we knew we were doing better than the people before us, right? Like mm -hmm. um, even if there was still Roundup involved and things that we may be questioning now, the chemistries were much softer. The amounts that we sprayed were much less mm -hmm. constantly working. Um, you point to the Castiles at uh, Bethel Heights and really right thinking um, Al McDonald at Seven Springs, uh, really committed growers, Joel Myers, mm -hmm. and, and people always looking to do better, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we throw around sustainable as uh, like it's conventional, and that's not necessarily a fair assessment. You know, the sustainability effort is around here. It's always been talk about what can we do better, not like we've gotten there, mm -hmm. but what are we going to improve on? And that's been one of the beautiful things about grape growing in, in this region, that there's been a, a constant evolution. Um, uh, I think we could look at chemistries and like that to where um, except for the brave souls like Doug Tunnell, and in fact at Elk Cove there were sites that we farmed organically. There was always this looming element of risk, right, that we were leaving ourselves exposed to. Uh, I've heard some of our neighbors saying that there's not high disease pressure in this area. We are blessed by the fact that we don't have pests and things that are a big issue in Washington, for example, mm -hmm. right? But we also have tremendous pressure from mildew, which is a slippery slope leading to other complications if it's not dealt with. Um, um, but yeah, constant evolution to where now organic practices uh, are becoming not just possible, but uh, you know, site to site. Some sites easier to farm organically, but uh, yeah, I think sustainability, um, a bigger element than we really give it credit for. Again, the tendency to lump it in with this conventional business. Sure. Um, and nothing wrong with certain conventions, as I think as long as we're constantly progressing, right? Mm -hmm. And 
the transition to organic here from sustainable farming and Michelle Soder had never been too keen. In fact, she wouldn't allow the use of herbicide here. That's Roundup, right? That was, again, for my generation, a very soft chemistry. It was an improvement from uh, pre-emergence and things that really were persistent in the soil, right? We felt like we were doing well, but Michelle wouldn't allow that. And uh, eventually the notion of doing organic, Tony no stranger to it when he was at Spotswood in the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, certified that vineyard as organic. It, he humbly talks about the fact that he had neighbors living all around this beautiful, what is now a Grand Cru vineyard, right? Was in the middle of people living around them. So as a gesture to the neighbors, went down an organic path. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that is translated here to, um, from sustainable farming to organic farming, and uh, more recently, um, a biodynamic certification, which involves the whole farm. Can't emphasize that a whole uh, enough. Um, and I, I don't want to say even live, but live as an organization is, um, you're, you're, by mandate, you have to look after the whole property rather than just the vineyard, right? Um, wild beasts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, a little guest here, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, in evolution, I don't, I think I personally don't want to talk about biodynamic as higher ground per se, right? Um, certainly here taking part in that change at this property, it's, it is part of an evolution, mm -hmm. right? But um, I don't think that we would separate, uh, uh, say that biodynamic is necessarily better than organic. Mm -hmm. um, certainly people on our team, Nadine, the ranch manager here, might tell that story a little bit differently, but um, part of the, the beauty of this process is learning from her and perhaps she a little bit as she's on this path too, right? Mm -hmm. um, the farm here has really been intriguing in what we learn from how systems interact mm -hmm. like that. You mentioned earlier that you had been befriended Jimmy Brooks, uh, yeah. an early proponent of biodynamic farming. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, uh, when it comes to biodynamics, is there a? Have you found people expe are expecting these things? Are you expecting finding that customers are expecting the word biodynamic or word sustainable? Uh, you talked about how it's like conventional now to be to say that. Is it an expectation from the user? Yeah. Um, well, drinker? there's a bunch of things bundled into this. I do think you know um, Jimmy was part of. Uh, I'd put Sam Tannehill in the mix, mm -hmm. and um, and certainly Doug Tunnell. And uh, I don't believe Mike at Beaufrere is certified, but all dabbling. And there seemed to be a kind of a culture of uh, uh, French consultants that really painted a, a, a kind of a wrong picture for a lot of us in terms of an understanding of biodynamic practices, mm -hmm. um, an emphasis on mysticism. And, and like any good consultant, uh, you could only really get there through the consultant mm -hmm. as if they had some understanding that you couldn't possibly tap into, sure. right? Um, and I think uh, it was a bit of a distraction, really, this kind of late 90s influence. Those consultants don't seem to really be on the landscape quite like they were. And there's certainly a number of uh, uh, really successful and genuine biodynamic growers. Again, Doug Tunnell, mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, Nadine, our ranch manager, certainly a proponent. and. Um, have I answered that question well enough I for you? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious if the pressure is coming oh, from the industry or coming from you. You mentioned uh, the the market sure. concerns. So um, I wouldn't see pressures. Um, every market, every account is a little different. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, certainly in in the Bay Area, if you were uh, uh, next door to uh, what's Alice Waters' famous restaurant. Um, oh. Chapinese, right? Um, you couldn't get in the door, right? If you didn't have uh, an organic or biodynamic uh, uh, credibility. Sure. And uh, in the broader market, um, I think people still want good wine, first and foremost. We would have to talk about sommeliers, the role of psalms and just gatekeepers in general. Um, the, the conditions are as different as people are different, right? In terms of their expectations will stay away from natural wine right now, which is such a can of worms. Certainly we feel like all wine is natural, right? But uh, anyway, um, I'm not sure the market really rewards um, the biodynamic uh, 
certainly certification is blurry whether you say you're biodynamic or whether you're certified I'm not sure that there's a really uh, if, th if there's an appreciation for that I don't think there's necessarily a monetary reward for that in other words can you charge a few more bucks for your wine because it's uh, biodynamic um, it's it's still pretty mixed out there and very blurry in terms of organic biodynamic you you are because you say you are um, yeah, a little little murky there you know and uh, sustainable which can be a very good thing uh, indeed uh, we'd point to live mm -hmm. as uh, the folks who are so good at uh, really uh, you know they have a tool in terms of their inspection criteria mm -hmm. that is really useful um, in terms of getting people to look at what they're doing and the idea of you know you you might use this chemical but boy you better do five things that are good right. uh, to uh, compensate that and again the whole idea is getting better constantly improving that's a really good way to go through life it seems to me right um, uh, so I think sustainability often uh, misunderstood misused uh, mm -hmm. and uh, again market demands to do that I don't think so I, I feel like it's almost driven more by community, mm -hmm. right? Um, as we talk to, we might work with a 12 or 14 different growers, and I'm quick to point out, uh, you know, gosh, at some point, I think 60% of Oregon vineyards were certified, right? Like, that's really conspicuous uh, from where it was and from the fact that there is clearly a, a, a cultural element in this community that respects that, finds value there, and I do think that uh, the certifications often uh, generate a good sense of community. Mm -hmm. None of that stuff is perfect, right? There's plenty of people who would be telling this story very differently. Um, but I'm pretty sure I've witnessed uh, good things coming from any level of certification. At the very least, we assess where we are and we're conscious of what mm -hmm. we're doing. Um, and I think that's key to any discipline, right? To be aware and, and as conscious as you can be of what you're up to. Market demands, I don't see it as pressure. I see these still as choices. Mm -hmm. And I think there's just a strong pull in the direction of good farming. And again, a long uh, history in Oregon of a kind of greenness, you know? Red state, blue state, we can certainly say it's a green state, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think in a positive way, mm -hmm. and that's translated uh, in our way of life, our, uh, the foods we eat and uh, produce, and um, the food we grow that just happens to be wine. Sure, sure. That's a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, I'm curious about you. You've worked for some very, for, for some kind of diverse people in the industry here, and some with people with some very strong opinions about about philosophy. Yeah. I'm curious about your own personal kind of winemaking, grape growing, vineyard practices philosophy, and how it's evolved to, the, to where it is now. Yeah, as diverse as those things may be, I tend to look at the commonality mm -hmm. as um, that they're uh, all three of the. Uh, places I've worked have all been really rooted in vineyards, right? Like very much about growing wine. Beaufort still remains that way, even if they purchase fruit from a place much like we do. Um, there's real, uh, that relationship with the grower and with the place that we're, the different place on earth that we're farming, we still very much carry the same intention and that is to capture something from that place and uh, and bottle it and to uh, work at it in a way that's responsible um, consistently looking at leaving the place better than we found it and better for the generations that will follow us right that there's a real importance and diverse as the places might be or our projects might be and you know, um, I think Mike Etzel remains, for the natural wine fans, it's not mentioned often enough how, what a natural winemaker and wine grower he is, right? Um, at El Cove, the long history of good farming, in the, you know, in estate vineyards, that their family is rooted in this place, mm -hmm. right? And, and here at Soder, you know, for Tony, one of the privileges of coming up here was uh, to own something, right? After years of purchasing grapes or making wine for other people, 
the privilege and the pride of having his own place. And I love Ted Lemon, a great winemaker, is, uh, he talks about the nobility of your site. <laughs> and we talk a lot about what can we do here that you can't do anywhere else? What can we coax out of this place? So diverse, maybe, um, but the commonality is, again, an emphasis on what can this place do? or what can we find, what can we continue to amplify in terms of the distinctions in this place. I think the, the way you get there is secondary to the intention, really. Is, sure. Does that make sense Absolutely. to you? Absolutely. So what does it mean to you for a bottle of wine to say Oregon on it, or Willamette Valley, or, or Yandel Carlton? Yeah, I don't think I did um, enough justice to your previous question. When I think back, it's not a correction, but I think that the two can go together. Um, okay. It's all about those places that you met, and and the, you know, blending is a beautiful thing. There's a long history in Oregon of uh, the Elizabeth Reserve at Adelsheim, for example, I think was a um, more or less a concoction, an mm -hmm. artful blend that they can create by putting places together. First job is, of course, to capture the distinction in sites. And whether, if it's a single vineyard bottling like this estate, the Mineral Springs Ranch, it's one thing we, um, under the North Valley label, create a reserve that we think might, in some vintages, rival the quality of what we do. Oh, I mean, for just one second. There. Okay. Okay. Does that sound better? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so, um, uh, what does it mean to be an Oregon wine, and or what are my views in terms of that sort of thing? I think um, you know my views likely mirror the those of the ownership here, where I've been working to some extent. It's. Um, I've long said that I think we all make contributions, right? Um, everything we do in this industry, what we're doing right now is a contribution for the future, right? This, your efforts right here today are making a contribution. We have no idea how important they're gonna be perhaps mm -hmm. at the moment, but um, um, the, what you're capturing in terms of people telling their story is, is important. Anyhow, for me personally, certainly um, organic farming and the in first learning was that we can affect what we're doing by the, the good work we do throughout the growing season, right? That we're constantly growing a vintage and growing a wine, working on this, this it's a, a succession of tasks that the beauty of being able to do vineyard work and make wine from it is your, your it, there's no, this stops, this begins. Right. Maybe the process changes, right? But we're still working right. for the same end all the way through that. That's been consistent. For me personally, techniques um, increasingly secondary to uh, just doing good work, you know, um, lots of ways to get there, whether it's punch downs or pump overs, you know, uh, I've worked in a lot of different facilities with a lot of different tanks and um, I would just be quick to say you, you'll you figure out what works and uh, no two vintages alike. Um, you know, my, yeah, my personal beliefs are very much mirrored in where we're sitting right now. You know, I've spent uh, a good part of my adult life uh, working on this project and I think making some meaningful contributions. Um, what's it mean to be Oregon? You know, again, it's so self-evident in terms of, uh, you know, you start with Oregon, Willamette Valley, Yamhill County, and then of course the AVAs that um, we've grown to. Uh, the tasting I just walked out of was looking at uh, the origin bottlings we do, which are representations of maybe our prejudices about what these AVAs can do. Certainly the sites we farm, um, but we would expect our Dundee from uh, most recently from the Vista Hills Vineyard, let's say, to be red fruited and lighter structured, aromatically engaging a uh, certain expectation for a lithe texture. Uh, the Eola Amity bottling or Yamhill Carlton bottlings will be very different than that. And so, yeah, it's constantly looking to capture distinction in these places. And um, this is a young industry, let's keep in mind, but um, the DOCs or DOCGs in uh, Italy, for example, fairly modern phenomena. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly the great, great grandfathers knew their way around Barolo pretty well and knew that some sites 
performed differently, in sure. some cases better than others, just like in Burgundy, where for years that uh, certain vineyards have uh, an identity and an expectation that uh, uh, really define their place. And the, the diversity is part of the charm. And uh, long, long rambling answer okay. here for you, but I think it's very much about we're still discovering new things about what a, you know, there may be a classic Jory or Nakaya uh, soil type in Dundee, but boy oh boy, that same classification of soil type in the Eola Amity Hills, the resulting wine is very, very different, sure. right? And it's, uh, yeah, that, again, it's part of the intrigue is capturing and discovering those nuances. Sure. You mentioned the North Valley Vineyards project. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, it was. Um, uh, it's been a, a, a great ride, and will continue to evolve. Um, really, uh, born out of the fact that uh, this place where we're sitting today, Mineral Springs Ranch, is so special and so singular. Really, from the first harvest, where we were farming the Beacon Hill Vineyard, also Yam Hill Carlton, but a very different uh, resulting wine. Boy, oh boy, it, from the first vintage, putting the fermenters side by side, you didn't need to label them, right? Because you could smell the mineral springs. There was an aromatic signature. There was something uh, beautiful about that. Anyway, the Soder label, um, the intention was to keep it singular, mm -hmm. that that label would be for this place, right? And uh, around 2005, um, uh, three years, four vintages into working with Tony, um, this vineyard was coming into production. We felt like we could f flesh out the cellar a little bit and we purchased a few grapes from uh, what is the uh, Nicholas Vineyard or Anamkara right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And boy oh boy, they were different. They were different than Beacon Hill. They were different than Mineral Springs. And I think that captured Tony's attention. And uh, within a couple years, we felt like we could uh, perhaps take little bites from areas and blend something that would have that regional identity mm -hmm. you're talking about, right? Something that would be very much about the northern Willamette Valley. What does that mean? It's, it's I think, really we're, we could say the same things about what you would want from a Willamette Valley wine, but there's such privileged sites so densely populated mm -hmm. in the northern part of this region most or not all of the recognized nested AVAs in this area we would bank on their diversity, but quality and certain uh, threads that I think are consistent, that being vibrant natural acidity, right? Um, able to coax ripeness out of grapes just enough and not too much, even in the context of the very warm years we've been experiencing, mm -hmm. harvest conditions and all. Um, a consistent thread of, we felt like with North Valley, uh, with a string of strong warm vintages recently um, we can forget how really different the wines can be from year to year we embrace vintage variation in this region I think um, the idea with North Valley was that through blending uh, even in a really challenging year uh, maybe the old vine high elevation sites don't get as ripe as we might like for them to mm -hmm. but certainly the low elevation precocious sites would provide us a beautiful core of fruit to build and blend with, if you see where I'm going. Sure, we thought absolutely. we could blend something that would be, and I think um, the North Valley Classic, as we call it, that is a, a relatively modest price wine in the bigger picture of Oregon, uh, every vintage, we were really proud of the fact that uh, it, and on a very high quality level, delivers a little sampling that you can't mistake for anything but Oregon Pinot and sure. probably wine from the northern Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. Is there an overall goal to the project? Is it kind of that? Is it just sort of like a, like a sampling of areas or is there a... Well, um, it's like everything else evolving, mm -hmm. right? A series of bottlings under the North Valley label uh, called Origins we're hoping to transfer into something that will be more akin to the estate wine, right? Um, Soder will reappear on the label and in fact uh, Tony's purchased a vineyard down in the Eola Amity Hills that will be a second uh, estate vineyard for us, right? Yes. And I, in a perfect world, we'd have little sites selected that would represent all the AVAs, that we would have built-in diversity and mm -hmm. distinction from those sites. We've 
done that through relationships with uh, growers, with grapes that we're purchasing, leasing, however the, uh, you know, the financial arrangement may be. We still farm to our standards and capture something of the place. That will become, that part of the North Valley project is morphing into something more estate driven. And the North Valley wines will continue to be regional blends, both mm -hmm. on a reserve level, really dumb name uh, in many ways. Uh, certainly in America, I think Washington State is the only uh, label uh, considerations. In other words, anything can be reserved in America except for Washington State. <laughs> anyway, our, uh, we have a North Valley Classic and a North Valley Reserve, and they continue to represent regional blends that uh, every year it allows us to explore a little bit, even if a contribution from a grower ends out in a blend, it's still a really important contribution sure. and makes the wine better. So yeah, I think um, continuing to evolve, um, the, what we discovered in the origins, we'll um, gladly take uh, in-house as a more estate project where the North Valley wines will be continue to be built on relationships with growers. Sure, sure. So what what, are, what do you see for the future here at Soder? What are you seeing in the next five, ten years down the road as you guys are looking ahead? Yeah, and of course we are looking ahead. And um, I think it's a constant, you know, just constantly trying to raise the bar. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean to us? That wine quality that we can capture out of this vineyard would continue to be on a higher and higher level as our tastes change and as we discover things uh, uh, yeah, constant refinement of just, and keeping in mind that every vintage is a little different, right? Um, uh, moving in that direction. I mentioned the ambitions to perhaps have other vineyards that we own and totally control and potentially will transfer to the next generation. Really important. And uh, again, for North Valley, continuing to um, try and uh, just earn a place in the big world for those wines, right? Sure. To get the right kind of attention. And uh, nothing's more fun than seeing a wine enjoyed, right? Whether it's in a restaurant or uh, a retailer. So yeah, I think the, the future here will continue to be good farming. Perhaps the emphasis on the farm growing. Mm -hmm. Estate, further estate developments. Um, certainly in our mission statement. And uh, yeah, just the continuation of good work. and. Uh, for the North Valley project, I think you know we're on course to uh, again cement the relationships, more security in terms of the the fruit sources that we have, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, keep doing what we're doing. What about concerns for the future, specifically for soda? Are there uh, what are what are the things you guys are looking down the road and seeing as potential issues? Well, um, I, I don't know about issues, but certainly um, one of the uh, goals that we would have in mind is kind of economic sustainability, right? That um, if there's 300 wineries in Yamhill County, there might be 30 that are real businesses, right? Um, that so often uh, the <laughs> wineries are on kind of life support from someone's other fortune, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. right? So kind of economic sustainability, um, uh, I don't say that lightly, right, that we want to do a kind of business that um, there's a certain level of satisfaction and viability to making the business work, right? sure. and, and along with that would ensure um, that there could be succession that would be successful, right? So and that's for Tony's kids to run the place and for this to be the kind of place that that my kids or your kids would want to come to work at, right? Because culturally, we've held on to something that is, and, and grown something that's sure. important. Sure. Um, I know you, you mentioned earlier, and I didn't want me to follow up on this, you mentioned a liberal arts background. So I'm curious uh, how that liberal arts background set you up uh, in the wine industry and uh, got you going. Yeah, I don't know that um, I uh, actually had started college with the intention of being a musician and never doing anything else. It's a <laughs> recurring theme. There's lots of musicians or former musicians in this business. I don't know that there's a, a direct path uh, for any of us that way. Again, I would look beyond myself to other people. And it's not exactly like drifting here. It's more like finding a path that you can 
go on. Uh, so no, I don't think that there's a, like, um, you know, with young sons myself, um, what they're doing in college. One of them, a recent Linfield grad, as a matter of fact, uh, will his economic degree uh, be the key to his future? Yeah, it's sure not going to hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but coming from a liberal arts background um, at Linfield, uh, yeah, with a major and like that. Uh, anyway, I don't know that, that, that those early choices define where we're going to be. Sure. Right? Um, I think it's part of a lot of us on different paths finding this path. And uh, mm -hmm. I can't say that um, uh, a group, you know, where we grow up uh, might have more to do with that. There wasn't a lot of wine on the table in my house growing up. It would be a special occasion, you know, that uh, uh, a favorite neighbor uh, was coming over or something to celebrate before there was wine on the table. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's about the best I can do um, in terms of background and nothing really, uh, other than perhaps maybe uh, those of us who like to read, uh, which I used to do a lot more of, uh, <laughs> wine's really good. Uh, for that, because there's such interesting stories, you know, uh, as long as history, there's wine in that picture, right? Absolutely. So you mentioned a connection with Linfield. I knew I met your son Aaron when he was uh, when he was there. <laughs> uh, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on Linfield and its foray into wine education. Boy, oh boy, I uh, I can't uh, think of a better path uh, for uh, the evolution of um, and the contributions. There's several uh, uh, people in management here that are Linfielders and without the wine program, and I think the wine program can only help, but I do know from uh, having taken a few classes early on at Sonoma State where the wine business is a function that there's been a real absence of uh, training for people in the industry. I know at least a few years ago there was, there hadn't been a book published in winery economics since 1984 or something like that, right? <laughs> and one of the reasons I think the um, wineries are often very guarded about their financial structures, one of them is that often they are on some sort of life support, right? Sure. That the projects are driven by, uh, just to put it in a crass way, kind of ego, or the fact that people have made a fortune that they can afford to support uh, something like this. So the business of wine has been overlooked for so long. Uh, the bigger picture that I think the Linfield program is building is so timely, so accurate. Um, the Evanstad's very generous. I'd like to think they might be even more generous. I will say that loud and clear, um, as the program deserves more. It's a really good idea. And if uh, they're going to tag their name on it, dang it. Uh, Come on, <laughs> I'll just uh, I'll say that for you. But uh, no, it's a brilliant program, and Greg Jones, such a great thinker, great personality, mm -hmm. a real uh, a real pillar, I think, in in wine in, in general, and and not just another would be rock star winemaker type, which is so irrelevant in so many ways. Um, yeah, I think the program is is just a, a brilliant. Uh, will make great contributions to the community. Again, I could point to half a dozen Linfield grads on this in our <laughs> circle, right? Um, sure. At very high level positions, have already made a contribution, and this more focused uh, course of study that you guys are taking part in is it's going to be uh, really terrific. You know, um, obviously OSU has done a great job with food science and like that in Chemeketa with a, a real vocational aspect. This is something that uh, it's a it's unique, I think, uh, in what's going on in America. Again, I could reference Sonoma State where they even produce MBAs mm -hmm. for the wine business. Now, Linfield is uh, it's it's a unique and really terrific development. We hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, what about the future of the Oregon wine industry in general? What are your What are your thoughts as you look five, ten, fifteen years down the road? Yeah, um, the, the near term things are, um, you know, I would be uh, dishonest if I didn't uh, sense that um, for small producers, as we've traditionally known, um, I think there's always room for someone good, right? But um, it's a, an increasingly competitive world and that is so complicated by the three-tier system 
and uh, this may be more answer than you Please. want, but uh, it's the nature of wine distribution in this country and these huge the power of these distributors that are often obligated to serve uh, the interests of large, you know, rather corporate structures mm -hmm. really create an imbalance in terms of uh, the velocity with which wines are pumped into store shelves and wine lists and the economic implications of that are making it increasingly difficult for small producers. Uh, I think when I entered in the 90s, uh, the small winery thing was just perfect for kind of an artisan effort, but now that there's 300 of them, it's really difficult to distinguish yourself. Good things have happened. The quality of wine around here, I think, is consistently elevated. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing, but and with that, it just makes it a little more difficult to distinguish yourself. Mm -hmm. Small producers, I think, uh, where this industry was so built on little mom and pop projects, economic forces, both uh, uh, driven by the cost of labor mm -hmm. in the little vineyards that we all need, um, the evolution that will happen will make the really small wineries, um, uh, it'll, be, it'll be a little more challenging, mm -hmm. I think, just by the sheer number of people participating, right? There's only so much pie in that category. I think you could talk about the fact that while Pinot may be great, it's still only this much of the pie, right? And um, a little bit of growth in that, in that little section uh, represents a very large increase by percentage, mm -hmm. right? See where I'm going with this? Like, uh, yeah, just a just a small increase in what's already a small segment makes it statistically more difficult. Yeah. Um, I do think that we continue to be lucky for having an identity in this region, um, with lots of rumblings about whether we should be doing something besides Pinot Noir, and of course we are. But I think. Uh, the emergence of Chardonnay taking a rightful place as a wine that is going to be great mm -hmm. from this area. And again, distinctive as Oregon, not just another Chardonnay, right? But something really special is possible. And that's, we have a long history of Pinot Noir being distinctive mm -hmm. and special and having an identity. It's really the next chapter in certainly American wine. It's, Again, I'll repeat, what can we do here that you can't do anywhere else right. on Earth? What can we grow in this beautiful, cool climate uh, potential? So I, th I think there's a great future for Oregon wine. We've been on a rather uh, steep growth curve. I don't know that that ends. You know, certainly Tony can tell stories about uh, Napa, right? Uh, there were comparisons here to, it was always like Napa 25 years mm -hmm. ago. and. Are we on a path like that? Well, it seems like there's been really good success that way. There's been uh, a history of, uh, again, capturing a unique Oregon personality and style that continues to evolve. But uh, yeah, I'd have to say the future is strong. Um, and I think we'll, uh, yeah, I, I would think it's a really bright future. I think the industry will continue to grow and with that a lot of change. And that's why I would think for the very small producers, always room for somebody good, mm -hmm. but it's just the very competitive nature of the wine and beverage business in general that will, will be a big challenge. Sure. We'll see, right? Sure, exactly. You mentioned uh, the idea of the, 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 how hot your vintages have been lately and, yeah. and, and how the weather seems to be warming for your, uh, I'm curious about uh, if you have any concerns about what you grow now and, and being able to grow it in the future or thoughts on a different varietal if it just keeps getting warmer? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. Um, and I would like to, um, the first response would be, I think all of us have a responsibility to be paying attention mm -hmm. to what's going on around us, right? And. Uh, talking to people who have been here 50, 70 years, you know, um, have you ever seen seasons like this? No. Um, and we're repeatedly seeing the wettest, the strongest, the latest, the earliest, mm -hmm. these extremes that should be getting our attention, right? And to, at the very least, regardless of where you are on that issue of climate change or climate denier or whatever those are, certainly we can't ignore the fact that we 
are probably impacting this, right? And so let's start with the fundamental acknowledgement that we better be paying attention and we better take a good look at uh, our habits and what we can do to improve that. Let's start with that foundation. The carbon neutral challenge that was set forth years ago, man, we learned so much from that. Um, it wasn't just the kind of contest nature of it and there was no winner, of course, right? But the idea of being challenged mm -hmm. to do this, it was really mind blowing and in the kind of most unsexy ways possible, right? <laughs> like um, people see solar panels, we have some here um, and good, right? That's green and positive, but um, it's the things you don't see often that it, the motion detectors that shut lights on and off when people come and go from rooms conserving. Um, I point to the fact that uh, it was probably with the carbon neutral challenge, we weighed a bottle. We were asked to measure what we're putting in the waste stream or recycling. We had a bottle that weighed over 900 grams, right? This is like two pounds of glass. Mm -hmm. It was a very standard bottle right. in the industry. It weighed two pounds. We have an option now that is just as pretty that weighs 500 grams. Like with one change, we almost cut that in half, right? And that's kind of the unsexy stuff that nobody <laughs> sees that have so much to do with, uh, you know, sustainability efforts and uh, um, and looking forward to things we can do. The warm vintages that you mentioned, um, I'm happy to say uh, I've mentioned Doug Tunnell more than once. Uh, we shared a panel um, talking about our um, climate change kind of part of it, but more our efforts for sustainability, for conscientious grape growing, and we were asked to bring two wines that we were both proud of. And both of us, without consulting each other, chose 08 vintage, and it was a couple years ago, and 14 mm -hmm. as examples of wines we think are delicious. And you could look at that on the surface as two bookends, right? Like kind of the last vintage we can think of that was very classic Oregon. What's that? Boy, oh boy, all the way three weeks into October, it took that long to get ripe, um, you know, uh, convincing ripeness, but no excess, b brilliant natural acidity, concentration, uh, s delicious wines that were ample um, and very much uh, typical in the truest sense of the word type, not sure. just average, but true to type. And then 14, the product of the vintage that is the, you know, was the earliest uh, uh, on record, the wines that were so rich, we couldn't believe the levels of ripeness. You know, back in the 90s, we would, uh, uh, couldn't have, have, I don't think seen that with a couple of exceptions, you know, maybe 92, something like that. But um, you could look at those two vintages as bookends, right? But I think Doug and I chose them for one reason, they were delicious and we were proud of them. And we felt like they were both statements about what Oregon can do, right? So um, we, uh, in our in-house things and in the R&D department, have uh, yet to have anything but passing conversations about other varieties. Um, we talk a lot during the growing season, you know, from the minute the um, the 19 vintage is already taking shape in many ways. We're in a kind of a sleepy, literally, hibernation period, dormant right now. But from the minute those vines leaf out, we begin the story of the 2019s, sure. right? And there's certain mile markers along uh, the path. Uh, bud break, one thing, right? Leafing out, but here in Oregon, bud break to uh, flowering can be a very different period of time. Uh, maybe both driven by summation of heat units, but uh, the fact is if we get two Aprils instead of an April in May, that may very well delay that flowering, right? And with that, there's, it begins this matrix of things like where are you on earth on the longest day of the year, right? The summer solstice, are the plants flowered and off to the races and banking that sunlight or like in 11 where it's July 4th and we haven't had flowering yet, Boy, oh boy, we're already on the, the days are getting shorter, and it seems to me if it takes 100 plus days to get grapes ripe, holy cow, we're going to be near November before right. that harvest happens, right? So we'll, we'll respond, I think, to what's going on, and um, for us personally, other grape varieties haven't really, um, I mean, it's still refining uh, rootstocks and um, clonal things where you plant, right? Um, 
I think even the elevation has changed in my short 20 something years here where um, over 600 feet, you would wonder if things would get ripe. Right. Now, 600 sweet feet is a pretty sweet stop spot. Um, I'm pretty optimistic that we'll keep doing what we're doing. Again, not to de-emphasize the fact that things are changing and that it's important and that we should actively be talking about it and doing as much as we can to respond and acknowledge those changes. But um, in in our world right now, that isn't planting Tempranillo or right. varieties or Syrah. Yeah, the chances of ripening Syrah around here are probably a little better than they looked 20 years ago, <laughs> right? Based on the last five, if not going back to 12 in terms of uh, generous growing seasons, right? But um, I still think there's an environment that can ripen Pinot in a really special way. I don't think we're losing our cool climateness uh, to the extent that it's going to change wines here. You know, there's certainly evidence with the very rich wines we've produced in the last years that there's uh, the, the needle is moving a bit, but um, I think the next time we see a 14 vintage, we'll be a little bit better prepared to respond. Sure, sure. So that's all the questions I have prepared for you. Uh, is there anything else I should have asked you? Anything else you'd like to talk about that I No, I think if anything, um, I would just, um, you know, we started in a really good place. You asked good questions about community here. And um, I continue to think that's still uh, an important element, again, with a lot more of us. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly things have changed. Um, I know here at this place with this business, um, we take a lot of pride in the culture of things, right? And I think um, that translates out to our growers and the people we work with, our partners, even selling wine, right? So um, yeah, just an, an emphasis on the Oregon community and hopefully the fact that the provincial nature of things that was uh, so evident um, when I first arrived here in a charming way and in a sense of adding gravity to the community rather than a kind of a backwater sure. simpleton way. Provincial in a beautiful sense of place, community, identity, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's what I got for you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your candid, candid answers and the thoughtful answers, and we'll go ahead and end the recording. Thank you so much for visiting with us, and it's my privilege to be here with you. Thank you.